Make ready the way of the Lord. Many of you are mothers of families and you have to make ready in this week for the feast of the Lord. But I would invite you in the Lord's name not to miss the Lord in the process. It can happen. I think you know that full well. Oftentimes, a simple Christmas with much love is a greater encounter with heaven and with one's brethren than a very expensive and ornate one where all the peace has gone out of the window and charity to boot. In the monastic life, the pure enclosed one, there was only that other one, but it was full of intimacy, full of specific Christmas grace. Quiet chanting of the antiphons where all the centuries passed before one's eyes, the waiting for the moment, the stillness of encounter, and in the Carthusian rite of prostration after the elevation of the host, boof, all are on their noses, et verbum caro fractum est. That's Christmas. Santi is actually a danger insofar as he's getting a lot of intention which belongs to the Lord himself. As though from heaven the Lord was saying, where am I in my feast? In Italy right now, they're discussing whether the word Natale, the birth, is it to be used at all. Now, Advent operates on two levels. We prepare the way of the Lord, but we prepare also the coming and the encounter with the coming at the end of time, which for us will be at death, which often times comes uninvited and without warning. Somebody here perhaps may not be here next year. One time in the monastery, I was thinking about this issue of the way in which we travel on and our moments just slip through our fingers and cannot be recalled. And I looked at the clock face and the clock face looked at me and said, who is winning? In French, Baudelaire talks about that, about time, old father time, qui gagne sans tricher, who wins without cheating. In the place, he talks about how it's relative time. Au temps, suspend ton temps, au time, stop your flight. He is in ecstasy at the time with a girlfriend. And he talks about those who are in pain, fuyez, fuyez pour eux. Fly, fly for them that stop for us. I remember the novice master at Clatab telling me after about three hours of manual work in silence as we came back, that's where one seen that the real time is not that of the clock. Three hours in the cinema goes quickly. Three hours in manual work doesn't go quite so quickly. But right now, time is going very quickly for most people in civilized society. You know why? They have means of cancelling it. The pain of boredom is immediately eliminated by the pressing of a button. They all have in their pocket means of eliminating time. As soon as they're alone, they cancel it and they don't notice it passing. Multiply that by the year, the decade, and the life, and you've cancelled your life as well. You haven't faced time. You couldn't. You couldn't bear the stillness. So Christmas in the world has become that. And the stillness of waiting is not felt. Indeed, Christmas is celebrated before the feast. St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in today's epistle, talks about the real issue. 
Actually, there are two bits. I'll touch on both. But the second one first, the question of judgment. We can't pass judgment on each other. If we try to, we are sitting in the Lord's judgment seat. And especially if it's to do with, for instance, a priest or a bishop, it's not good. For we know that the Lord insistently has demanded that that bit be reserved unto him. If one has a mobile tongue and has the energy to speak, let it not be to speak of a priest or a bishop, but to pray for him and to ask others to do the same. You know that there is a demon behind every priest waiting to make him fall. So that's where the use of the tongue would be useful. Don't help to make him fall, because priests can get discouraged, and indirectly you can be part of the problem. A lot of backbiting goes on amongst holy souls, pious souls who abuse their tongue and judge. Judge with daggers in their tongue. Forgetting that the Lord has demanded that that be reserved. But the other, because I've touched on the question of the priesthood, is what Paul himself says here in a quaint little verse which could pass us by unnoticed. Brethren, this is how men should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We're handling God. And it's unfortunate that what has happened in recent years is that one is expecting to come out of a seminary, a kind of glorified DJ, who's good at handling dynamics in church. But is he an intimate friend of God? Well, I want to come into that one because, as you know, there's a certain amount of uncertainty about the celebration of what we're doing calmly at yet with the bishop's permission, may not be so, because he now has found that he can't easily do what he would have normally the authority to do. He has to go to a higher authority, to Rome itself. And I was wondering how to handle this. So, in prayer, I brought it to the Lord. And calmly, calmly, this came back. Give them a simple teaching, which might help them not to be anxious. Most of you here come not because of its Latin at all. It's because Jesus is in the midst and you know it. There's no noise, you can hear a pin drop. Grace is free to operate, you're given the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And when you worship, you don't have to think about anything else but the one you're worshipping. You have confession before or after, no one disturbs you in church, and some of you I know actually have fellowship afterwards, quite independently, which is nice. So there's a whole package there, and it's not essentially based on the language. It's based on something far deeper, which you have found in the safe refuge of the unchanged and unchangeable old right, which has a history of 2,000 years and many saints. Now, I just want to help you to see, therefore, that should we be obliged to do something that we would prefer not to do, it wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world. Listen, and don't react immediately, internally. I propose to you what we have done, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I can see it could happen. I propose to you to be aware that in the strictly monastic life, the issues that you have found do not arise. So when it comes to, for instance, application of new laws, it happens in love and charity and the same reverence and respect. Why? Because the inner dynamic is correct. It's all for God. And whatever we do, we do it with love and respect. The result was this in the monastery when I was ordained. People would come to us and even people now, I mean consecrated people, future priests and so on, 
And they say the like of this in whatever language. Remember this comment from a Frenchman who's about to be ordained. C'est la messe la plus belle. It's the most beautiful mass ever in the present rite. Now, people who came to us didn't know that it was the present rite because we were facing the other way. We had incense every day, and every word except the readings were in Latin, the Gregorian chant hitting the rafters, and just a moment of the medieval chant carrying on in the old medieval abbey, built for that with a perfect echo. The result was that without any fuss or bother, we were presenting what was actually just about the new rite, but it was all the trimmings of the old, and it was very reverent, and people thought it was the old. Now, do you see what I'm saying? Look at the real problem, because if one is half clever, one can get over a problem if one has a bit of cob on. So, just avoid, should it ever have to happen, absolutes, because absolutes lead to daggers, and daggers don't please the Blessed Trinity and have no place in the house of God. There is another thing too. St. Paul himself talks about charity in the Agape and in the house of God. He wants the table of the Lord to be a place of fellowship and condemns anything which is of a contrary nature. There is amongst us an element that you won't get easily elsewhere. We are all on the name, say, wavelength. We all have love for one another. Most of us know each other a bit. and get no use with confessions. And one thing comes through. There's an intensity in the air which easily one doesn't find elsewhere. That need not be lost. So try and distinguish between the levels and importance of a question. Because should it ever arise that we can't do exactly what we're doing now, we can find a way of circumnavigating the problems by a little bit of half-intelligent Irish cop on. If, and only if, we can distinguish the levels of the importance of a question. That's what people don't seem to be able to do. Proof. Aggressive blogging. We don't have to have that in our life. Love one another was the one command the Lord insisted on before going.